I didn't get through this. Let me get to where we're, our scripture text is so you can turn there. One day I like really loaded it up with, with a lot of slides. Um, turn in Joshua chapter 5. We're looking at verses 13 through 15. And Sarah, you'll be glad I'm wearing these glasses. Sarah loves it when I wear half reading glasses because I can kind of look down at everybody and kind of do one of those things. So, But it's interesting to... I think I, I talked about it a couple of weeks ago, how the Lord really laid on my heart to plan out all of the, the messages for the year. I mean, he has shaken that up and twisted that around. And, and, I, and I rather enjoy when, when the Lord does those kind of things. Um, but he's certainly done it. We, we may never get through the book of Romans. We got through four verses of it. But, but that's okay. Because, and I want to say this about, about this message today in Joshua. And still in Titus, it's interesting how the Lord brings about messages. And, and this came about, Titus planted a seed just in a passing conversation with us about this encounter with Joshua and this commander of the Lord's army. And, and God just gripped me with this scripture and, and I, thinking about it this morning, thinking about it personally in my, in my own life, I think that this is probably, could be one of the most important messages that I've ever preached as far as application to the Christian life goes. And the reason I say it like that, I'm saying it differently, the most important message I ever preach is the gospel. And that's, that's truly the most important message that you could ever apply or appropriate in your life is faith in Christ and what he's done for us on the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection. But as the Christian life, and I mean as, as a follower of Christ, taking what we're going to get and what I pray the Lord delivers through this message today and beginning immediately applying that to our lives and already applying it to my life, it has changed how I'm approaching things and praying for things and my outlook on things, my outlook on, on ministry and all of these things. And, and so it, it has that potential, I believe, and, and I'm praying that the Lord will use it in that way in, in your life, that we can, we can leave hearing this word today and get outside of these walls and immediately start applying it, even before we get outside of these walls, just immediately start applying this to our lives. And, and here's kind of the universal aspect of this, and this is sort of where we're all in the same boat. Very often we are facing difficult situations in our lives. Anybody here facing difficult situations in your life? Have you faced difficult situations in your life? We're there, and so when you come to this encounter with Joshua and Jericho, and I list Jesus, and we'll get into why I put Jesus into that, Jericho, Joshua, and Jesus, you're going to understand why, but it's an amazing thing that happens, and I don't know about you, but as I've thought about this, and I thought about the walls of Jericho, how many men here know the story of the walls of Jericho? Yeah, and I say it kind of, you know, you're in church, you know those stories, even if you haven't been in church, a lot of people know about the walls of Jericho, and the walls fell, and all of those things happened, and I don't know, maybe you're different than me, but I've always looked at the story of the walls of Jericho falling, I've kind of looked at it as the response of the Israelites walking around. And you remember what they did. They walked around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they walked around seven times and they blew their trumpets and they shouted and the walls fell. I always looked at that as, okay, that's God doing that. But he's doing that in, in sort of a response to, to their faithfulness kind of thing. And, and, and so I, I've just kind of had that view of it. But I realize, in our text of Scripture, you're going to realize it too, the true victory and the key to the falling of the walls of Jericho begins in chapter 5, in the latter part of chapter 5. So if you turn there, I'm going to read it, chapter 5, Joshua chapter 5, verses 13, all the way down through verse 15. So go ahead and follow along with me. It says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. 
Almighty God, we, we come before you, Lord, in great humility, approaching you boldly through the blood of Christ, but asking your blessing, God, upon your word. Yes, as it has been read, and now, Holy Spirit, we ask you, please teach us. There's something in here, God, that we need to hear today, no matter where we are in our lives. And, and so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you're the one that teaches, that you teach me, and that the word that we get from you today in the area, in the, the point of contact that it touches our lives, that we would begin applying it immediately, Lord. So we want to yield this to you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take about a minute and just kind of run through a quick background of where the Israelites are at this point in the book of Joshua. They've wandered through, through, the, through the desert, through the wilderness for 40 years. That's over with. Moses is dead. He is, he is passed away. Joshua is now the commander. He is leading the Israelites. He's leading the army of Israel, if you want to call it that as well. They, the spies, two spies, have gone in. They, they, Rahab, she hid them. That has taken place. They've crossed the Jordan. This is an interesting one, too. All of the men of war that were the Israelites that passed through the Red Sea, they're dead. That generation is completely wiped out, except for two. But the, those men are gone. So now there's a new generation that has risen up. Now, that's a new generation of men who are going to go to battle. But it's also a new generation that have not been circumcised. So they are circumcised, which is that, that covenant sign that God is with them and they're going to follow God's covenant. They're going to follow God's leading. And then something interesting takes place. They cross the Jordan and they hold the first Passover in the land of Canaan. Now something happens that a lot of times maybe isn't talked about, but after that first Passover is done in the land of Canaan, manna ceases. No longer does the bread of heaven fall upon them. For that 40 years, God was providing them bread of heaven, but until when they crossed in the Jordan, and they crossed through on dry land, they took those 12 stones and, and left a marker on that. But the point of it was, is that they didn't need the manna anymore. They had reached the promised land. And they were going to be fed with milk and honey and all of these things and all that the land that God was giving them was going to provide for their needs. So the manna ceases. All of these things that I just mentioned, those are significant events in the life of the nation of Israel. But I want to focus for just a minute now. How do you think Joshua felt? This is a really cool thing. Sometimes, uh, well, a lot of times, I need encouragement. I need encouragement from the Lord that, okay, what you want to share to the people that will hear this message today, that it's from you. And I got that in a really, really cool way today. I had this message, you know, all week it's been on my heart. And, and you know, sometimes you say, anybody second guess themselves? I second guess myself a lot. And I was thinking, Lord, is this really the message that you, that you want us to have? And this morning during my devotion, which is, which is more of a worship devotion, it starts off with a great song. It's a new thing I've started. I put it on Facebook if you guys have seen it. It's, it's an app you can get. But anyway, it starts off with a worship song, and then it goes into a worship devotion. And the song was just tremendous, and it was just talking about how never, not once has God failed you. Not once has he not been with you. And then it gets talking in the scripture, and you'll never guess who it was about. Joshua. And the message that I had in worship devotion today was about Joshua. And it was just... It was just the Lord telling me, yes, this is the message that we need to hear about Joshua and what's going on here. So thinking about how Joshua felt, because again, Moses had been leading them 40 years through the desert. Moses was the man of God. Moses was the man in Israel. Now he's gone and then Joshua takes this command of, of this nation. And there's some things that are said to him in the first chapter, and you don't need to turn there, but, but God is speaking to Joshua and he says to him, I will not leave you. Those are important words. Those are words that I need to hear from God. I know he won't leave me, but it's nice to, to receive that encouragement, that reminder. I'm not going to leave you. And he tells them, he tells Joshua in verses 6 and 9 from chapter 1, be strong and courageous. Tells him that twice. Tells him, no, do not be frightened or do not be dismayed. You think of these things that he's telling him. I won't leave you. Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. Why do you think the Lord was saying these things to Joshua? Because he was afraid. 
Because he did feel like, Lord, you can't leave me. I'm afraid that you might leave me. I, I could be dismayed with all of this that's put on my shoulders. And then he gets this promise. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What an encouragement to Joshua because they had already crossed the Jordan River. Now they were about to go to war. And he's the commander of these soldiers, these men who, again, the old soldiers are dead. These are new soldiers that are rising up now. They are not, for all intents and purposes, battle-tested. So he's about to go to war. They're about to go to battle in Jericho, a fortified city with men that he doesn't know how this is going to turn in a, in a physical sense. How is this battle going to go? God, he does believe God has given us the land, but how is this going to go? Because the battle still has to be fought. And so that's where we kind of pick up in, in Joshua chapter 5. And verse 13 is interesting. It says, when Joshua was by Jericho, what was he doing at this point by Jericho? We get the sense that he is by himself around Jericho. And what I believe he was doing, he was on a, on a reconnaissance mission. Because he's the leader, he's the commander, so he's on a little recon, and he's going and he's, and he's looking upon Jericho. And I, you, know, you need to imagine what he was seeing. Some of the excavations around Jericho have found that at least there was a wall built that was about four and a half feet wide. That's just how wide it was. That's not to speak of how tall it was. And so he's probably out there surveying this, thinking in a military sense, okay, God, you've given us this, but we still have to fight. How are we going to do this? How are we going to overtake this city that you have called us to do? And also probably on some sense understanding that Israel was part of the sword of God. They were part of judgment upon the Canaanites because they were heathens. They were doing horrible, horrible things. But I'm sure he's wondering, kind of in a, in a human sense, developing a battle plan. How is this going to happen? How am I going to lead these people? These are great walls before the nation of Israel. And so I thought about this in a very practical way in our lives. A lot of times, there are Jerichos that are right in front of us. There are great walls that are right in front of us that God wants torn down. But how are we going to do it? A lot of times, we'll look at these things and we'll see these walls and we will absolutely be overwhelmed by what stands before us. And it doesn't have to be a, a real wall. It could be tragedy, it could be hurt, it could be illness, it could be addiction, it could be fears and anxieties. Whatever, these create walls, these create barriers, they create strongholds in our lives that God wants torn down. And here's where this application begins to affect my life and how I approach things like that and even how I'm praying about things. Because it says Joshua, he's there, Joshua was by Jericho. And it says, then he lifted up his eyes. Now, this is an interesting thing. Why were his eyes downcast? Well, some could say maybe his eyes were downcast because he's looking down upon it. Maybe he was bent down in prayer. Or maybe he was bent down, and I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when you're overwhelmed, is your face up or is it down? Regardless of what and the reason his eyes were cast down, it says that he looked, he looks up, he beholds something. He beholds a man that was standing before him. Now, this was an interesting thing, because remember, Joshua is about to go to war. He's looking upon Jericho. They have crossed into enemy territory, so to speak. And he sees a man standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. That's not what I would consider a, a peaceable stance. That's not a man of peace. That's a man of battle standing before you with his sword drawn, ready to fight. And then Joshua does something interesting. It says that as Joshua goes to him, he approaches him. He doesn't just back off, but I think that he's approaching him to encounter him because Joshua is thinking in his mind, it's time for battle. There's someone standing before me, their sword is drawn, so he approaches him in almost a military sense, and he asks him a question. He says, are you for us, or are you for our adversary? And ultimately, what he's saying as they stand upon the edge of battle, the Israelites, he's basically saying, are you on our side or are you on their side? Are you an Israelite or are you a Canaanite? And the interesting response to this, it just kind of is its rather amazing. He said no. He asked them two questions. 
Are you for us or are you against us? Are you on our side or are you with our adversaries? Do I have to run you through with my sword? Or are we going to fight? Or are you going to fight with me? Are you going to fight against me? How? He had to figure this out because at this point he doesn't know who it is. And he says, no. But, and here's the contrast. Here's the flip of that statement. No, I'm not an Israelite and I'm not a Canaanite. And I think that's kind of the, the, the crux of what is being said here because this is not a normal human being. I'm not a mere soldier is ultimately what this is saying. He says, I, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. I am the commander of the army of Yahweh is ultimately what he is saying. And it says, and some stretch it out, that, that you can even include the heavenly host in this. That he is the commander of all of the things of God. And so, yes, okay, he's there to fight on behalf of Israel if Israel is on God's side. Because that's what this commander is there to do. He is there to fight on behalf of God and for those who are God's people. And he says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And this to me, this, these next words here, four words in English, will absolutely change your life. And how you pray, it will change. It's already changed my, my, my idea of ministry and how I need to look at it, how I want to pray. He says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And you may think, well, wait a minute. What, what does that mean? Now I have come. Think about this. In, in the conversation that Titus and I had, he had asked me about this. Is this a Christophany? And you'll, you'll remember, and some of you may not know this, a Christophany is basically, there's theophany and Christophany, and a Christophany is in the Old Testament a pre-incarnate form of the second person of the Trinity, which is Christ, it's Jesus, but he's not born yet, he doesn't have the name Jesus, he's the Son of God, he is the second in the Trinity, but every time he would, we would be on earth, because there were times where he appeared to, to Abraham. There were times, I believe, also when you look at what happened with Moses in the burning bush, there were these times where, obviously, it also um, happened throughout the book of Judges. There were times with Gideon as well, where it was the angel of the Lord. And you know it wasn't just a mere angel, because here's, here's kind of the, the kicker on this, and it happens here too. No real just... Solely an angel will receive worship. Only God is worthy of worship. And we see happening in response to this, Joshua falls on his face to the earth and worships. And then what does this commander of the Lord's army say to him? Take off your sandals, take them off your feet. For the place you are standing is holy. What made the ground holy? The presence of God. Remember Moses before the burning bush? He said, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. It's not that that place in Sinai was holy. It became holy because God's feet stood there. So you think about what is being said here. They're about to go to battle. Joshua is, is trying to surmise, how is this wall going to fall? Because it has to fall. We have to conquer this land making his plans, trying to, trying to figure it all out. And he runs into Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm not, I'm not for you, I'm not against you, I'm for God. That's who I'm for. And if you're for God, you're on my side. But he says, now I have come. In essence, what he's saying to Joshua is, it's not your military strength that's going to make these walls fall. It's not your reconnaissance that's going to figure out the weak point in the wall that's going to make it fall. The reason these walls are going to fall is because I have come. Because Jesus showed up. And now this is where it can have this, this application in our lives. Because when you go to, again, you go in, the, in chapter 6 and you actually find out what happens in the obedience of the Israelites and doing some bizarre things. I mean, how many military people take the strategy of, okay, we're going we're gonna to attack this fortified city by walking around it? That's absurd. But that's not what brought the walls down. What brought the walls down is that Jesus showed up. Amen. And so how do we approach this now? How do, we, how do we apply this in our lives? I have done this, and I, I think I've made mention of this maybe when we were going through Psalm 119. I, I can't remember. Maybe going through um, the study of the Lord's Prayer. But so there is often when I am praying about a situation, 
and, and it's, it's just so subconsciously done. When I pray about a situation, oftentimes, I am laying out the details of how I think God needs to answer this prayer. You think about it, let's say somebody is sick. Somebody, um, Dave, as you mentioned, uh, someone with cancer. Well, we'll pray, Lord, we want this person healed. Bless the medicine. Bless, you know, and we just start laying out all of these ways that we think God needs to work through to answer the prayer that we've given, that we've submitted to him. Ministry is the same way. I've thought about ministry, and even our ministry up on the slopes. You know, I try to promote it. I try to do all these things, and, and I realize something today. I can do all that stuff. I can pray all kinds of prayers. We can, we can go through all of these things that aren't necessarily wrong, but unless Jesus shows up, forget about it. When I pray for somebody... It doesn't matter if I formulate it out detail by detail and give God the parameters in which he's to work. I just take this up and I lay it at his feet and then let those words echo back to me. Now I have come. I'm letting it go. I'm handing it over to you. The wall that's before me, my Jericho, whatever it is. And I thought about this on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. I think the Christian church has a huge Jericho, a fortified city before us, and it's called abortion in our country, protected by law, all of these things. And I don't know about you, but it's overwhelming. You think, how in the world are we going to tear down these walls? How are we going to overturn Roe versus Wade? What do we need to do? Where do we need to go? There was a huge march in Washington. I think 650,000 pro-life supporters marching. That is good. I'm, I'm not knocking that. But the reality is, if Jesus doesn't show up, then the walls of abortion that are built up strong and fortified in our country are not going to come down. Right. Yes, we need to pray about it, but we don't need to pray about it in a way where we have to figure it out. Because I think what happened is when Joshua met the commander of the army of the Lord, he realized, I can let this go. Yeah, he still was involved in it, but he had to let it go and trust that God was going to be the one to tear down these walls. There are walls in our lives that are built up. There are things that are before us that we feel absolutely hopeless and helpless in. And this may sound weird, but that's a good place to be. Because when you're at that point, that's when you have to yield to the Lord. That's when I hope that you see, just as Joshua saw, I hope I see it in my prayer life and in my ministry life and in everything that's going on in my life that I see that, wait a minute, there's one before me and he's got a sword that's drawn. And I know he's going to fight on behalf of God. And if I am on God's side, then if God is for us, then who can be against us? Amen. And so I need to remember that I don't have to ask Jesus, hey, are you for me or are you against me? He's for me. But I do need to remember, wait a minute now, he has come. Jesus has to show up. I even thought about it in the context of church. We do a lot of good things in church. We pray, we give offerings, we sing, we preach, we love on one another. These are important things, but I realized something even this morning. If Jesus doesn't show up, then what's really accomplished? Jesus has to show up. He has to be active in what we're doing, in our prayer life, in our ministry, in our struggles. He has to be there. And he is there. We need to hand things over to him and watch him tear down these walls, tear down these fortifications. Because remember, and we often talk about it, and Paul talks about it, that, that our weapons, they're not of a carnal nature. They're not. They're of a spiritual sense. They're, they're of a mighty aspect of God who is able to pull down strongholds. And I was looking at that word today. I was going through that, through how the walls of Jericho fell compared to what Paul is saying about pulling down strongholds. And it's, and it's different. Because I even went back to the, the Hebrew and how that would be relayed into the New Testament stuff. But anyway, I won't bore you with that big study, but, but it's different. Because when the walls fell in Jericho, they fell flat, okay, just, just straight down. They didn't collapse in. They collapsed beneath themselves and fell straight down. 
But when the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about the pulling down of strongholds, what he really is saying there is that they are obliterated. They are absolutely destroyed. It's not that they just are pulled down and then we got to climb over the rubble because that's what would have happened when the walls of Jericho collapsed. They had to climb over that stuff and get into the city. But when, when the weapons of our mighty God, the commander of the Lord's army, pulls down strongholds in our lives, they are obliterated. We don't have to climb over the rubble. It's gone. It's disintegrated. It's vanished. It's done away with. And I think that's what we need in our lives. That's what I need in my life when there's those, those Jerichos that are before us. I mean, as a country, we need this in relation to abortion. We need this, this stronghold that's been developed. We need the walls obliterated. How's that going to happen? I don't know. And I'm not going to try to pray anymore in a way thinking that if I can figure it out in prayer, then that's going to make it happen. That's, that's not the magical twist of prayer. That's not how it works. What works is when we lift something up in prayer, we lay it down at the feet of the Lord and we say, show up. Amen. Show up in your way and in your might and in your power and in your strength and for your glory. Show up. And then look out because he's going to show up. And when he shows up, he's going to start to impact things in our lives. And the greatest aspect of this that I can find the greatest fortification that anybody can build in their life or the greatest fortification that stands before them is the fortification of sin. It's the bulwark of sin that separates us from a loving God who is holy and us who are unrighteous and unholy. It stands before us. And so if we look at that, and sometimes we do that before we come to Christ, maybe somebody there hasn't come to faith in Christ and they're looking and recognizing, wait a minute, I'm separated from God because of my sin. I acknowledge that. So what do I need to do to fix it? Well, maybe I'll go to church. Maybe I'll read my Bible. Maybe I'll pray. Maybe I'll, I'll give offerings. I'll help the, the poor. I'll do something. Well, what you're doing is you're standing there like Joshua and you're looking at the wall thinking, how can I get through this? How can I do that? When in fact, what you need is the one to stand before you who's the commander of the army of the Lord to say, now I have come. I have come. And I've laid down my life for you. I've done everything necessary to pull down that wall of sin, that barrier that's keeping you from the Father. I have made it to where you can have access and eternal life and forever be in his presence. I've done that. And he did it with his own life. And he laid it down. And he's raised it back up. He is alive to be able to save to the uttermost for every person who calls upon his name. That's the greatest Jericho that anybody is going to have before him is the Jericho of sin. But praise God, the wall has been torn down. Appropriate that in your life. Reach out in faith and take hold of what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. Because Jesus is calling out to you saying, now I have come. All of your efforts, they fall short. You've worn yourself out with attempting to save yourself. Trust in me. Jesus says, now I have come. And I pray that he's come in your life. And I pray that this truth of this message, appropriating it, applying it to every aspect of your life, will absolutely change how you pray, how you approach struggles, how you approach ministry, because we all have a ministry in some sense. I pray that it will last with me and how I approach ministry as well. So let's pray and let's commit this to the Lord. So Lord Jesus, thank you for meeting Joshua as he looked down and surveyed the, the field that would become the field of battle. And Lord, we, we don't know the intricacies of what was going through his mind. We speculate. But the reality of it is, is he met you, Jesus, before that battle even began. Because you had showed up. You were there. You were there to fight on behalf of God for the glory of his name. And God, for those of us who are your children through Jesus Christ, you are there to fight for us. You've shown up. You are still the commander of the army of the Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that whatever we're going through in our lives, Lord, we all at some point have this wall of Jericho before us that Lord, we, we, can't, we can't get through. Jesus, please show up and tear it down. Obliterate it. Destroy it. Grind it into dust 
so that it no longer, that we don't even have to pass over the rubble of it, God. We just pass through it, beyond it, in victory in Christ. But Father, if there's anybody who stands before the wall of Jericho that is labeled sin and separated from you, open their eyes to see that truly the commander of the army of the Lord Jesus Christ has laid down his life already. He has made the, the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that is worthy and necessary for us to have eternal life. And all we have to do is reach out in faith and take hold of it. Just trust in it to believe that, yes, Jesus, you have come and you've done everything necessary for us to have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, that you're alive. That you're alive and on our behalf and you're interceding right now for us you're standing in the gap. You're at the right hand of the Father. You're our great high priest ministry. As the accuser comes, and he will accuse, and you say, no, I've gone to battle for him already. The war is won. We praise you for that. And so, Father, we want to yield this to you. However you would use this, Jesus, in this message, in this truth, we just ask, show up. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.